Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session on scaling digital public infrastructure. The last 18 months or so have reiterated the value of digital systems to verify our identities online, to make payments, to share data, um, to, uh, to support a range of um, everyday um, interactions. Yet access to such critical infrastructure is very unevenly distributed across the world still, and we can still improve and harmonize the rules governing such systems. Today's panel will explore how to scale the efforts of various forum partners, uh, governments, funders, businesses, and civil society organizations to address some of these gaps. Um, and we'd love to hear from you throughout the session. For those of you joining us through TopLink, please use the chat window, the link, the Slido link in the chat window to let us know your questions for the panel and comments. I would also like to welcome our moderator for today, uh, Michelle Javando, who is uh, leading programming at the Omidyar Network, a leading social change venture and investor in the space. Michelle, over to you. Manju, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And we welcome you from wherever you are tuning in. If you also are joining on social media, our hashtags are hashtag SDIS21, and of course, hashtag DPI for all. I am incredibly excited to get started with a conversation on how we expand access to digital identity. And joining are some of the uh, distinguished leaders who have been leading this conversation all around the globe. First, I'm happy to bring forth Baud Vigar Sohil, the Director General of NORAD, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, which also manages the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Baud, so, thank you so much for coming today. Next, we have Sigve Brecki, who is the president and CEO of the Telenor Group with telecom operations in the Nordics and Asia with over 188 million customers. He also serves as the distinguished chair of the GSMA Foundation. Sigve, thank you. And finally, last but not least ever, <laughs> is Minister Sina Lawson, who is the Minister of Post digital economy and technology innovation for Togo. Minister Lawson, thank you so much for joining us. So I am going to get right into this conversation. And again, I encourage the audience to chime in with any questions that you have throughout. But we have a funder, a minister, and a business CEO who are all joining us on this panel. From each of your various perspectives and roles, I'd love for you to share with us why you're involved in this work and what you think are the key barriers to universal, universal digital public infrastructure. Minister Lawson, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor for me to, to be here today. Um, the, the reason why I'm involved as, as a cabinet uh, member it's, uh, in, in charge of digital, I have to be involved in, into this work, but uh, more importantly, it's the, the basis for the country's development. You know, there is no way you can achieve um, development, economic and social development without using digital. And because we're building, because we're doing a lot of foundational work, the way we build digital system does matter in terms of the society we want to create. So um, we've been involved in transforming and in, in digital transformation of the country and of the administration with simple rules such as enable and increasing transparency in the process, um, such as inform, informing in real time um, the citizens, uh, with the pandemic, we were able to set up um, a, cash, a digital cash transfer program, and we distributed approximately $34 million to um, a little bit less than 1 million individuals. So it was a scheme using a universal basic income. And what is absolutely innovative in that is that first, it was entirely digital, 
Second, in order to improve the way that we were targeting beneficiaries, we used machine learning and artificial intelligence. And third, we informed every day where we were making payment, we would inform the population in real time. So these are changes that can only occur when you use digital. And we do believe that anything we do within this ministry has the potential to profoundly change the way um, Togo is, um, is managed. So we have a transformational work and responsibility in every project that we lead. So now to answer the question that uh, you ask in terms of the barriers, I, I think that the first barrier when you ask a, 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 a developing country is obviously digital divide. That's the most uh, obvious thing that comes into mind. But you also have to, to, to understand that a lot of countries are building their systems in silos. Not only countries are building systems in silos, but within a, a, a country, within, within the administrations, again, um, a, a lot of the platforms are built just serving one purpose. And our objective in Togo is to increase interoperability, both using, of course, technology, but also regulation. And it's with simple exp explanations of how the, the, that we want to use interoperability so that when the citizens look at the government, it's one. There is one entry to any public service. And I think this is, again, something that is worth mentioning, and that is the way to fight against all these barriers. The second thing that I have to stress upon is all the legal and regulatory work we've done uh, we were able to, um, to, to, to adopt uh, privacy laws. We are, Togo is one of the first African countries uh, having taken privacy laws, uh, data privacy laws, and cybersecurity laws. Because in terms of barriers, um, trust you know, uh, um, is, is key to, to lower barriers to, to uh, scaling uh, digital public infrastructure. And in order to increase trust, you also have to set up a, a legal and regulatory framework which enables that to happen. The third thing is that, you know, it's never about the technology. Everything we do is about the people. So it's very important that any old DPI project be also linked with a digital literacy component that can enable us to better train our people to better inform them. I'll stop here for now. Well, you you would you can stop, but all I was doing was nodding my head through your entire <laughs> response, Director General. Let me turn to you. Your your response for this first question. <clears throat> well, thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation here. Um, I mean, uh, Nurad, what we do is we we partner with countries and to to assist them uh, in their development endeavors. Uh, uh, and so we, we basically work with global development and, and we, we do that with countries, with UN organizations, with NGOs, uh, so on and so forth. And, and the reason why we have turned to working a lot with uh, digital public goods is of course that these goods have the potential to transform what global development is, it, it, to transform the speed and the scale and, and what it's about. So basically because instead of developing solutions and supporting solutions country by country, sector by sector, uh, we can invest in goods that can be widely shared and developed at a totally different speed, right? And, and that also means that they can be scaled up uh, in real cost-efficient ways and at, at a very high speed. Now, one example is, of course, uh, the DHSI2 health system that was that's been that is being widely used uh, around the world now. Um, uh, Sri Lanka developed a, a COVID uh, uh, tracking tool out of it, and it's, it quickly spread to more than 50 countries um, to that. Uh, and that is also the reason why we have uh, co-created um, the alliance, like you, uh, like you mentioned. We believe um, that uh, digital public goods is an important part of global development in the future, and that it can really change the way we deliver services and work with development. 
in Sigve. Your response. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and it's a great honor to be on this panel and, and talk about a topic which is really close to my heart. As said in the, in the introduction, I'm representing Telenor, uh, a company that comes from a small country of Norway, uh, 5 million uh, population, but have decided to move into the, uh, the bigger uh, emerging uh, countries in Asia. So we have almost 190 million customers in markets like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, and, and Malaysia. Uh, our focus has all along been to deliver affordable connectivity services to the mass market. And with this, uh, seen the potential of driving greater digital inclusion uh, and being a part of developing societies. And that has, has brought us then into, into countries with, uh, with the large populations. And as also said, I'm also representing here uh, as a board member of the Mobile Industry Association, GSMA, which uh, basically is an association for all the mobile operators in the world, counting for more than 5 billion subscribers. What's really uh, I'm passionate about, and I think I, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in other mobile operators, is that when the last 20 years were all about uh, con connecting people to voice and, and then later data services for the first time, the next 20 years is about digital connectivity uh, and digital inclusion. And especially in the low and the middle income countries where mobile phone is the only device you have. There are no laptops, there are no computers, there is no fixed line. And we are have a strong belief that the mobile enabled services will actually be an important uh, important means to achieve the UN sustainability development goals. And some examples of that, already today, uh, around 1.8 billion people are using their mobile phones to monitor their health. 1.6 billion people are using mobile phones to access government services. 2.6 billion people are using the mobile phones for financial services, and two, more than 2 billion people are using mobile phones to improve their education. And that's also why the, this industry uh, association uh, has um, uh, a uh, foundation uh, board, which I'm also sharing, where we are working together with also donors and international development uh, communities like, like NORAD, uh, that board was mentioning. And this is because we also see a need to use our presence in these uh, countries to, to engage and develop projects that can utilize the mobile communication as a tool uh, to serve then support underserved and vulnerable population. And some examples of things we are working with in several countries, both in Af uh, Africa and in Asia, it's the impact on financial services, health, agriculture, digital uh, identity, energy, water, sanitation, and so on and so forth. Then to the challenges. I will say two main challenges or obstacles. One is the lack of private uh, public partnerships. We are struggling with, with getting the governments in this uh, uh, economies to really see that the only way they can actually support uh, their population with the, those, the, the services I'm talking about now is with digital means. So uh, I really would like the governments and all the help we can get from international uh, institutions to get the governments to understand that a public-private partnership is needed. And the part is regulation. And uh, we are heavily regulated in all our countries. And I support that. But we also need to be seen uh, as, uh, as someone that can support the development and the inclusion, uh, digital inclusion in these markets. And unfortunately, the regulations are stuck in the past and not suited then to, to see how digital means can be a part of the answer uh, to, to focus on, on the development goals. Thank you. Excellent, and we'll, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but Director General Bond, I wanna to turn to one of the questions that came from the audience. We're having a conversation about the need to scale DPI, but not just DPI, good DPI. And as we're thinking about how you define what digital public goods actually means, whether we're talking about open source software or open data, open AI models, 
uh, and building it, that adhere obviously to privacy and applicable best practices. What have you been able to do in your role at NORAD to really push us to think about actually building good DPI? What makes the difference and help some of our participants today really understand what we mean when we say that? Oh, thank you. Uh, um, that's a great question, actually. And, and it's also, I mean, it's uh, speaking to, to some of what was said earlier here, also about my two colleagues on the panel. But uh, what we have been doing in the, in the Alliance is, of course, uh, working with what we call key principles of, uh, of good digital public investments, trying to, to build some, you know, some basic principles that good investments should be within. And I think uh, if, let's, if we go through a few of them first, um, uh, it's really, really important that, uh, that a, a digital public good actually includes and empowers everyone. I think also Sigve uh, touched on this uh, before, uh, it, it has to be a solution that is widely available uh, you know, to, to men and women, to people with disabilities, that, which is a, a huge group in, in any country, to people with different political uh, um, affiliations, religious affiliations, so on, to minority groups. I think that's extremely uh, important and, and done, done in a good way. Uh, uh, the, pub, the, the global public infrastructure should be able to really be, be part of an inclusive development. So th that's the first thing. Um, then, of course, building systems that is trusted by the public is also extremely important. We see now, uh, in, whether it be in OECD countries or in developing uh, countries, uh, uh, you know, a, an issue uh, connected to trust in, in our digital infrastructure? Can we actually, you know, can we trust the platforms we're on and so on? And, and this I think is, is a key issue when, uh, when we're investing in these platforms that they have to be built in ways that can be trusted and, then that, and that governments uh, um, invest in making them secure uh, also, they can be safely used. Uh, a third uh, principle which is really important is that there, uh, interoperable with uh, the other systems that uh, a, a country uses. Of course, uh, like, uh, like the minister said, uh, uh, there's a danger that we are investing in, in, in uh, digital infrastructure that becomes silos in different sectors of society and silos that, that makes it, make it difficult to scale up investments as we go. So interoperability is a, also a, um, uh, a key principle. I would also, I would also say that, um, uh, that uh, uh, getting anon anon um, anonymized and sufficiently aggregated data flows from the digital infrastructure is really important. One of the advantages, of course, in going digital is the, um, the av availability of data. And if you can scale that up to be aggregate uh, uh, data at an aggregated level that can be used securely, you have a huge advantage in, uh, let's say, when you're doing planning or, or policy or, or anything in a country. So those are at least some of the key principles. I love that. Inclusive, trusted, mm -hmm. interoperable among of many of the great things that you just shared. Minister Lawson, I want to turn to you. Um, Togo in particular has a number of great examples of how you've leveraged digital public infrastructure. Even the example that you shared earlier that during COVID, you were able to get these emergency cash transfers to the most vulnerable. Uh, your program, you got up and running in 10 days. Um, and some great, particularly when you're thinking about women empowerment, you were able to get more women actually than men um, <laughs> supported in the program. But one of the questions that I wonder, and actually some who are joining us, how did you do this work in terms of gathering resources? And how did you think about building, particularly in rural communities? 
what are some of the steps that you took as a government to make sure that you had full scale uh, programming that was able to reach out to particularly vulnerable rural communities? So um, we, it, it, it was um, a platform that was built uh, in house and we, we were very, uh, we wanted to have a platform that uh, where people with no internet connection could um, register to. So we used a uh, USSD code, uh, which is a short code so that people would uh, register for free. And remember that at the time it was also uh, COVID. So we, we wanted to make sure that we wouldn't have physical inter interaction with beneficiaries. And it's important because when the, the, we, we, we had our first COVID case, very quickly we thought about how to support um, uh, the, the most vulnerable uh, Togolese because oftentimes um, the uh, poor people have to go out to earn their living on a daily basis. So when you um, implement uh, mobility restri restrictions, if you don't support them, then what, what it means is that you're going to let them die, which is not, not of COVID, but of, of hunger. So, so it, it, it comes down to the same. Um, the, 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 the concern we had was that we needed to identify so we don't have a, a, a unique social registry. So it was very important for us to identify who the poorest Togolese were. So we used um, uh, on the, we used a voter's ID because on the ID you have people's professions as they declared it uh, when they registered to have, um, to get their voter's ID. You have to know that in a country like Togo, uh, uh, because voter's ID is, uh, is free, uh, the majority, 93% of, of all adults have a voter's ID, whereas a uh, national ID um, comes with a cost. And so uh, only 30% of adults have um, have um, a, a national ID. So we had to use the most inclusive card, which was the one that was designed um, to be free. And that was also biometric because we wanted to make sure that the person receiving our financial support was a real you know, existing individual. But then what we also did is that we use satellite imagery to identify the poorest areas in Togo. And with the help of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, we were able to uh, rank district from the poorest. We have 400 districts in Togo. We were able to rank district from the poorest to the richest. Then the question was, within a poor district, and every time we would use the National Institute of Statistics um, to help because they would go and um, actually call, um, you know, tens, to actually 15,000 individuals to check whether, you know, what the satellite imagery uh, uh, gave us as information was accurate. So we did on, on the field verification, even though we didn't see, send people in the field, it was, you know, phone-based verification. What we also did was that, okay, now we know that this very district is poor. How do we identify poor people within a poor district? And for this, we used artificial um, intelligence using mobile telecom operators, CDRs. And so with Berkeley and uh, uh, researchers from the Innovations for Poverty Action, which is a US-based research um, NGO, we were able to, um, to identify, to have the phone numbers of people who earned less than $1.20, $1.25 per day, you know? And so I can, we can say that we are, I, I guess the, uh, it's safe to say that we are the only country which was able to, to pay out some people based on what a machine and artificial intelligence said. And we did that for 140,000 people and we spent $10 million with uh, received through the, 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 the help of a US NGO. So the, the program, the overall program using what I would call the traditional method, which was um, biometric ID and, and, and professions and, and, and people's location, we were able to spend uh, approximately $25 million and 10 million were just based on artificial intelligence. So we spent $34 million. So every time I say, I tell the story, people say, but what about people who don't have phones, you know? So of course, in all, when we, we talk about uh, digital public infrastructure, people need to have the terminals. They need to have phones. If it's phones, tablets, 
tablets, computers. And so what, um, so what we're doing right now, we're working with the World Bank as part of our biometric ID project. We are, we are working to find solutions to provide the poorest individuals with mobile phones and not one category of the population. It's not about providing women with phones because in a household, you need to have everybody have a phone. Every, you know, we need to find solutions to, to, to get everyone to have phones because a phone is no longer a, a, a device to make, you know, to, to have conversation. It's a device where you can, it's, it's your, your mobile wallet. It is a, a, a device where you can actually um, receive information. Um, it's, it's, it's a device where you can uh, store uh, critical, uh, you, know, uh, um, um, you know, your ID and other things. So this, this is the type of uh, thinking that Togo, but not only Togo, most developing countries are, um, are now having. And, and, and Sigway, we've, uh, in, we also are, are very keen to do PPP um, Togo is uh, maybe the only country in, um, in Africa that um, our, our cybersecurity agency, we created an agency and its operational arm was a, a company that uh, we created through a JV with a, a, a private company, a Polish company. So we have our um, cybersecurity agency being operated by a JV, which was the result of a PPP because we really do believe in PPPs. So uh, Sigve, it, it was almost a, pers uh, a perfect segue to you um, as we talk about innovation and public-private partnerships. Um, without question, we know that there's a role for each. So talk a little bit about what you imagine in the next five years would be the ideal for cooperation between the public, the private sectors, philanthropy, civil society. And then let me add one additional caveat. How do you strike the balance and the tension that sometimes arises between private companies and public data and information? How, how do you address that? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. And, but also thanks to the minister uh, and also board. They, they actually talked about exactly what I, I tried to talk about in my intro, uh, the, um, how mobile connectivity uh, can turn into digital connectivity and actually serve several purposes. And I think that what the minister mentioned from Togo is uh, exactly uh, how this PPP uh, partnership should be built to see how you can align public interests and, and then uh, 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 private interests. So I think uh, to answer your first question, what is kind of the perfect relationship? Well, the perfect relationship is to sit down and agree what can mobile connectivity and digital connectivity be used for to empower the societies. And then you need to talk about uh, how, for example, you can use mobility data, as uh, Vega uh, mentioned, uh, aggregated mobility data. Uh, we are doing that in Pakistan, for example, to, to help the government to see how people are moving. And then with that, fighting the dengue fever. Uh, another example uh, is how you can use uh, aggregated data uh, also to see uh, the movements between countries. That's a typical example of industry sitting down to solve, uh, so, so, uh, solve problems for, for the government. Another example is also what we do in some of the Asian markets, together with the governments, launching an app to go into the villages to register newborn that otherwise wouldn't be a part of the society. So, so it's to sit down basically and to see how, how can our presence be, be helping the government. But then you also need, uh, going back to what the minister said, uh, you need to then have regulations, which is actually then in favor of, of, of uh, making sure that there is connectivity everywhere uh, in all the diff different villages, even the, the remote villages, and find a mechanism where, where you make that possible. Uh, and I think that there are so many areas where commercial interests and public interests can be combined. The problem is that, unfortunately, uh, different from the Togo uh, government, most government is stuck in the past. They don't see how uh, everyone having a mobile phone or a mini computer in their hand can be a part of, of, uh, of uh, serving uh, uh, public needs. So, so that's why uh, I'm more than happy to, to be on a panel like this and speak to, uh, to policymakers that can talk to governments about that. Then to your data question. 
Uh, again, this comes down to regulations. It's about privacy laws. Uh, and, and we are more than happy to, to discuss that as well. We had the GDPR regulations in, in the Europe, uh, and we see that's coming into some other markets as well now. And we want to be seen as, as someone that, uh, that you can keep your data uh, with uh, in a trusted basis. Uh, and, and again, it's possible to do that with privacy laws. It's possible to do that, as Board uh, said, with, um, with uh, uh, anonymizing, aggregating data. But again, it, it is a discussion between the industry and the government. So I really look forward then to more and more governments picking this up as a way to, to uh, solve uh, educational problems, solve health problems, solve financial problems, and kind of bringing services that are currently for the very few in some of these countries into the masses. You know, what you said resonated so strongly with me. And I just thought about why, why we are gathered here at the World Economic Forum. We are together committed to improving the state of the world. And as we think through that frame, scaling digital public infrastructure for everyone solves that. And so thankful for each of your leadership. I'm, I'm going to share a, a broad question that I would like each of you to address, and we'll start with you, Bold. What are, what are some of the existing actors and new actors that we need to bring in to build the ecosystem for digital public infrastructure? And how do we do a better job of building trust in the system for people engaging in this work. So who are some of the new actors that we need to bring in? How do we catalyze existing actors? I'm, I'm looking at you funders across the world who are joining us today. <laughs> and finally, what else can we do to build trust? So we'll start with the director general. So you, you post the easy questions uh, today, I, 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 I understand. Well, you know, let me just reflect a little bit about that. Of course, um, what we, if you're talking about the ac actors, I think, um, uh, of course, governments and, and, and public agencies like NORAD will be uh, important. Uh, donor agencies, uh, but also, also agencies in developing countries and governments throughout. There's no way you can, you know, you can scale up and build digital public infrastructure uh, and, and invest in that without, uh, you know, a, a, a political ownership and an ownership from governments. So, so that's that's the basis. Then, uh, the, uh, of course, in, in this field, there are strong companies throughout the world, from the, the big multilateral, multinational companies to, to lots of companies, uh, uh, smaller companies throughout the world. And I think in, in getting the private sector to actually invest is key. We, we did um, we did the study from Nord outside this winter we looked at the Nordic countries and foreign direct investments from the Nordic countries. And, and foreign direct investments are quite huge, but of course we know that a lot of these investments go to, to already developed nations, to other OECD countries. But I was surprised to find that only 0.23% of foreign direct investment from Norway was to the least developed countries. And also when we looked at lower middle income countries, that could be countries like India, the Philippines, uh, Ghana, Kenya, for instance, uh, only two to 3% of, our, of the total FDI went to these countries. And that's a huge challenge. Uh, we need more of the private investments also uh, on, in telecom and, and, and digital public goods to go to where it's most, where, you know, where it's really needed to, to uh, developing countries. Um, then, of course, ju just a, a few words. You know, I, 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 we can continue also later on. A few words about the challenges. Um, and I think um, one major challenge that is important is, of course, uh, scalability. That that we need to we need to invest in in ways that can 
actually that can um, that can scale up solutions and, and quite a few of the existing digital solutions are not so easily scalable so that's really important and also what we see in many countries is that governing government capacity to maintain and to to keep good uh, digital systems uh, 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 is a challenge uh, and, and that's of course uh, a challenge also for for a a public uh, uh, agency, a donor like Norad, investing in institutions alongside the the, ins the investments in, uh, in on the digital side, and then of course I have to say to all to all the private uh, companies and to maybe fellow donors uh, in this call, funding is of course also still a, a, a huge challenge, also from the public side. When I look at what. Uh, what uh, uh, ODA, I mean, uh, uh, what are the, the development finance goes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, digital investment is still a tiny proportion of the whole thing. And if you compare it to, you know, what, what kind of effects it could have, it should be much bigger. Right. That is a call to action. Uh, Minister Lawson, your response, challenges, opportunities, who else we can bring in? So I think that it's- Oh, and um, can I add one caveat? Because yeah. you have just done an amazing job as sharing the Togo story. What do you think you're also doing that's been different than what other countries are doing? And how can we catalyze and bring them into this work? Okay, I'll stop. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so, the, so the first thing I would say is that um, we need to better understand the value of data. You know, um, earlier we were talking about the, the that we needed to to have um, to uh, anonymize. I, I think you say in English, anonymize data. We need to be able to aggregate this data. So we need new companies that know how to do that because oftentimes it's not that governments don't want to do it. It's just that they don't know how to do it. And there are now companies that exist that can do it. So we need to work with them. But when we say data is gold, there is a value for data and we need to understand how to use this data, okay? And so it comes, for example, um, in Africa, we need to have more data scientists. So the question in terms of training is how do we fund training to, to have data scientists, but not only data scientists. When you were talking about GDPR, uh, I think that we need um, new regulations that do not exist yet that really understand data and they can you know know how to value data how to you know there is the the the, the valuation of data there is the uh, all the questions about privacy and security but there are a whole bunch of new questions that we have yet to address and it it, it has to do with companies that understand and structure that really understand these issues and i don't think that right now within governments we have that level of understanding, but I don't even think that most corporations have that level of understanding because all this is very new. So we need to address them the, the same way as we do address innovation, etc. We need to have a, a team of people dedicated into thinking about these things moving forward. And it is going to be critical for us in Africa because the way everybody talks about leapfrogging, leapfrogging, but the way that we are building these systems is so much going to impact us in the future that we need to be part of the conversation. So if there is a call to action, I'm saying is that, yes, these conversations needs to happen, but please do include us from the very beginning and not while you know, everything has been decided. And by the way, that people remember that there is a continent there. And well, let's see what they say. No, we need to be part of a conversation early on because it is about inclusion and it is about interoperability. So we need to you know, agree on how we do things. And we may diverge because our view of data may not be the same view as, as Europe and the US because we're not at the same level of development. So we are, there are things that we're willing to be bold about that Europe or the US might not be as bold as we are in, mm. you know, uh, in, in terms of doing so. And I also want to, to say that there is one area when, where we really need to think is um, everything related to digital currency. So these are also, because when we talk about interoperability, we're also talking about to have the world as one. So we need to find ways that we can actually transact uh, mm. from countries to countries, from continent to continent in a way that is very simple, that is very straightforward. And um, again, these are areas where 
we 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 have a bit of um, growing to do. So in terms of what we're doing that other countries are not doing, I can't really uh, start talking about what other countries are not doing and that they should be doing. I think that for us in Togo, what our ambition is is to have a single platform, and so that you know this experience that you have when you go to. Uh, uh, to see an administration, you need to get a form and it becomes, you know, you go to administration A, a and they tell you in order to produce the form, you need to go to administration B and C and D. And then, and, 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 and you know that the administration right. could also just go and, 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 and have gather the information that they require you to have because the, it's another branch of the administration providing this information. So what we want to do is that we want to make the life of our citizens easy and we want to 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 um to um how would i say uh, to uh, require the administration to really do their job which is if you have information sort it out but don't ask the citizens to go from you know one one right. one so, office yeah. to another to try yep. to gather information that you're supposed to have as the public sector sigve love what do we need to do canalizing new actors what are the challenges? How are we going to achieve them? And then we'll get ready to wrap. Yeah, I would mention two points. Uh, the first point is that I think that donors, governments, and others would be surprised how uh, similar the sustainability agenda, uh, agenda is between all different players. And I think that the public part of, of um, this should really uh, understand how serious business is uh, to, to actually deliver on that sustainability agenda that we all are talking about. So what I, I see is working is when uh, uh, it has to be political led, as the uh, board said. So when, a pol when there's alignment between the government with private companies, with international institutions like UNICEF, World Bank, IMF, also those type of players, when there is that alignment and we in addition are able to create e uh, local digital ecosystems, that's when uh, the, 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 the true public partnership comes together. And that's also when trust is being built because then there's a common agenda to solve the bigger issues. The other part is what the minister is talking about. And my strong advice to all governments is to get your arms around data. You need to understand uh, privacy laws. You need to understand how data should be protected. You need to understand the importance of, of doing uh, the ethical part of AI right. If not, the medical data, the financial data, other data will get out of your hand and that will uh, create distrust. And then you can add the cybersecurity on top of that. So everything that has to data with, to do uh, unfortunately, again, many, most countries' regulations, it's in the past, it's not suited for the, the threat and, and the danger of distrust as we see it uh, today. All right, last minute, you have one sentence. What is the future of digital public infrastructure? Sigve, we'll start with you. One sentence. It's a private-public partnership where digital inclusion is being so used to solve uh, sustainability uh, challenges. Minister Lawson. Um, that's a tough one. I think the, 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 pub, the future of, of, of uh, digital public infrastructure has, has to do with uh, understanding data. It, it has to do with uh, inclusion because um, it's, it's never about the technology, it's about the people. So mm. if, we have to, if we have to install DPI, we need to think about what you know, we are trying to achieve. So it's really, for me, about improving the lives of people and it's, creating, it's about creating a better society. So I do believe uh, in tech for good. You know? I'm That's very right. proud every time that we use technology to do good things. Um, so, so, so yes, it's it's really about including people. It's about tech for good, and it's 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 uh, it's about improving governance as well. All right, Director General, bring us home. The future of DPI is the future of digital public infrastructure is bright as long as they're uh, uh, open access, uh, scalable, and, and can be easily shared. That's one sentence, I believe. <laughs> It is an honor and privilege to be with you all today, turning it back over to you, Manju, and thank you for your leadership in this space as we continue to build 
this at scale for everyone.